So, dear doctors, now let me discuss the hereditary disorders of the kidney. Now, if you take the hereditary disorders of the kidney, the hereditary disorders of the kidney include number one, Barter syndrome, then we have Gittleman syndrome, and then we have Alport syndrome, and next we have Liddell syndrome. So, let me discuss some of these particular disorders, and basically, these are the disorders which affect the tubules of the nephron. Now, out of which, first let me take up the discussion of the Barter syndrome. Right, let me take up the discussion of Barter's syndrome. Now, if you take this Barter syndrome, remember this is one of the hereditary disorder, and if you take the mode of inheritance of this Barter syndrome, this Barter syndrome it is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. Right, it is inherited as autosomal recessive manner. Now, what will be the features or what will be the pathophysiology in these patients with the Barter syndrome? Let me tell you. Before that, let me conclude a point that the features of the Barter syndrome will resemble the features of the loop diuretics. Okay, so Barter syndrome, rem remember, it resembles. The features of the loop diuretics. Right, the features of the loop diuretics. See, a point what I wanted to tell you here is like we have totally five groups of diuretics in which, like, we have loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, potassium sparing diuretics, osmotic diuretics, and as well as the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Now, out of this, the all these diuretics, the diuretics with high potency are your loop diuretics, right? Mainly they include like the drugs like furosemide and as well as bumetanide. So these drugs remember, right? These drugs remember, I'm sorry, it is not bumetanide, it is mainly the furosemide. Now, now you take this particular drug furosemide, it is a high potency diuretic. Now, where does this particular loop diuretics act? They act in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, right? These particular loop diuretics, they act at the le level of thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now, on the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, they act on a particular channel that is called as sodium, right? That is called as sodium potassium 2 chloride channel. So, on this particular channel, the loop diuretics act and they will inhibit this particular, right? Will inhibit this particular channel. And thereby the water reabsorption does not occur and thereby there will be diuresis. That is what is being done by your loop diuretics. The similar thing will happen even in patients with the Barter syndrome. So in these patients with the Barter syndrome, what is the problem is, the pathophysiology is, there is a defect in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle where there is defect in this particular channel. So if you see the pathophysiology. of the Barter syndrome, basically I have said you it is a genetic defect, right? So where is this genetic defect being present? Remember this particular genetic defect, it is involving a transporter channel which is present in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, right? Transporter channel which is present in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So, what is the pathophysiology exactly? The exact pathophysiology is a defect in the channel that is the sodium, potassium and as well as 2 chloride co-transporter. Right, 2 chloride co-transporter. So, the defect is in the sodium potassium 2 chloride co-transporter which is being present within the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now along with that, right, along with that there is also defect within the chloride channel which is being separately present within the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle and not only that there is also defect within the potassium channel as well, right. Let me show you the image of this. Now for example, you take this particular nephron, 
we have the following structures. This is your proximal convoluted tubule. Then you have the loop of Henle. In this particular loop of Henle, you have the descending limb, right? And this is the hairpin bend, and this is the thick ascending limb. Now, within this thick ascending limb, like what we have is the sodium potassium two chloride channels, right? Let me show you a magnified image of this particular thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. The defect within the transporter in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is the one which will, which will result in the Bartter syndrome. And your loop diuretics, it mainly acts on the sodium potassium two chloride channels which are present on the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now, you see this is a magnified image of that particular a single cell of the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. So, we have what is called as the sodium potassium two chloride channel. Then we have the chloride channel which is present on the lateral part of this particular cell. And then we have an ROMK channel through which the potassium is being secreted. Now, in these patients with the Bartter syndrome, there will be defect within this particular sodium potassium two chloride channel. There will be defect in the reabsorption of the chloride. And not only that, there will be also defect within the ROMK channel that is the potassium channel. Now, I will tell you one very important point here. Remember, only and only when, right? Only and only when all these three channels are working together, there will be development of a gradient and that particular gradient will cause the reabsorption of the calcium. Right, that particular gradient will cause the reabsorption of the calcium. All right, the gradient which is being created because of the reabsorption of the electrolytes through these channels in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle will cause the reabsorption of calcium into the into the interstitium of the kidney. Now, if these channels are not working, right, if there is any defect within these channels, then the calcium will not be reabsorbed. Right, then the calcium will not be reabsorbed. So, what will happen to the calcium? The calcium it gets secreted or it will remain within the lumen that is within the glomerular filtrate within the lumen of the nephron and then it gets excreted through the urine. So, during the process of the excretion of the calcium in the urine that may result in what is called as the nephrocalcinosis. We will discuss about that. So, basically, you have to remember that the problem is in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. And in which channels the problem? The problem is in the sodium chloride two potassium channels. Sorry, sodium potassium two chloride channels. Next is within the chloride channels which are being separately being present and as well as the potassium channels. Now, so as already I have said that it resembles mainly the loop diuretics. So basically now what is happening, the point you should understand here is along with this sodium potassium two chloride channels, right, along with this sodium potassium two chloride channels, the water is also being reabsorbed, right? Even the water, it gets reabsorbed, okay? Now, in these patients with the Bartter syndrome, there is defect in this channel. Once there is defect in the channel, do you think that the water will be reabsorbed? Even the water is not being reabsorbed, okay? So now, consequent to this, what will happen? Let me discuss, right? What will be the consequent events? So, in these individuals, there is salt wasting, right? There is salt wasting, and this particular salt wasting is in the form of the sodium chloride. The sodium chloride reabsorption does not occur, and not only that, there is also the water not being reabsorbed, right? Not being reabsorbed. Okay, so thereby, consequent to this, what will happen to the fluid volume? The fluid volume will be reduced, right? There is volume depletion. So, once there is volume depletion, what will happen to the renal perfusion? Renal perfusion is reduced. So, once there is reduction in the renal perfusion, there will be activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Right? There will be activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So, secondary to the activation of, right, secondary to the activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system, there is 
excessive production of the aldosterone. Now, what does this aldosterone do? The physiological action of the aldosterone is that this is the physiological action of the aldosterone. Now, you take this aldosterone. What this aldosterone will do is it will act at the level of the distal tubules, and this particular aldosterone, remember, right? This particular aldosterone, remember, it will cause sodium and water retention right it will cause the sodium and water retention and then it will cause potassium and as well as the h plus ion gets excreted out right this potassium and as well as the h plus ion it gets excreted out so the fluid volume is reduced in these individuals so once the fluid volume is reduced the renal perfusion is reduced and once the renal perfusion is reduced there is activation of ras due to which there is formation of the aldosterone so there is excessive formation of the aldosterone now what does this particular aldosterone does the physiological action of the aldosterone is that this aldosterone will cause the sodium and as well as water retention right it will cause sodium and as well as water retention and following the sodium and water retention this aldosterone will also cause the potassium and as well as the h plus ion being excreted out right excretion okay now a point that you should remember here is that so now where exactly is the defect in these individuals the problem is at the level of the ascending limb of loop of henle here the sodium is not being reabsorbed right not only being the sodium the the potassium and as well as the two chloride they are not being reabsorbed so now this particular sodium which is not being reabsorbed at the loop of henle this particular sodium will reach all the way up to the level of right up to the level of the distal tubules now this particular sodium which reaches the distal tubules some amount of sodium not all the sodium which is going to the distal tubules some amount of sodium it gets exchanged with the potassium right sodium it gets exchanged with the potassium all right so thereby the hypokalemia further increases one aldosterone is causing potassium excretion not only that the sodium which is not being reabsorbed at the ascending limb of loop of henle it reaches all the way up to the distal tubules there it gets exchanged with the potassium and thereby thereby potentiating the hypokalemia thereby potentiating the hypokalemia so let me give you a brief idea of the entire sequence of events of what i have discussed until now in a patient with the butter syndrome so remember right let me give you the sequence of events without having getting confused so the problem is there is defect in the sodium potassium two chloride channel in the ascending limb of loop of henle so due to which there is loss of sodium and as well as the chloride right not only chloride even the potassium is also being lost so due to which there is volume contraction and right? due to which there is volume contraction so as the fluid volume reduces the renal perfusion reduces and as the fluid perfusion reduces i mean the renal perfusion once it is reduced there is activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system so thereby there is increased secretion of aldosterone right thereby there is increased secretion of aldosterone now secondary to this this will promote right this will promote the sodium uptake and as well as right this will promote the sodium uptake and it will promote the potassium excretion okay next secondary to this what will happen is these individuals they will suffer from hypokalemia 
Now, because of hypokalemia, right, because of hypokalemia, the individual will have polyuria and as well as nocturia, right, nocturia. So, why do you think they are having polyuria? One, at the level of the ascending limb of loop of Henle, the sodium is not being reabsorbed. That is one point. Even though, see, you should not get confused with one important point is that, sir, aldosterone is getting released. Aldosterone is causing sodium and water retention. But remember, the amount of sodium and water which is being reabsorbed at the level of loop of Henle is much, much more excessive compared to that of the sodium and water retention which is taking place at the level of the distal tubules by your aldosterone. So, relatively, there is excess amount of the sodium and water which is being lost compared to that of the sodium and water which is being reabsorbed by the aldosterone. So, this is an important point that you should remember. All right. Next. So, because of that, there is polyuria. And the other thing is, once the individual lands up in hypokalemia, the renal tubules will lose their capacity to reabsorb the water and that will further cause polyuria and as well as nocturia. And another important point is that, because of this polyuria and as well as nocturia and hypokalemia, there is increased prostaglandin E levels. Right? There is increased prostaglandin E levels. So, these are the sequence of events which are taking place in patients with the Bartter syndrome. So, with this and one more important thing what I have discussed here is, the gradient which is being produced across the channels. Now, you see here. Now, we have the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel and then we have the chloride channel and then we have ROMK channel. Now, because of the reabsorption or the secretion of the electrolytes by these channels, it will produce a gradient and that gradient is required for the reabsorption of calcium. And if these channels are not working, the calcium will not be reabsorbed and the calcium starts getting excreted in the urine. So, remember in these individuals with the Bartter syndrome, the urinary calcium levels are increased. Right, urinary calcium levels are increased and that will result in what is called as the calcium stone or the nephrocalcinosis. Right, let me discuss the clinical features correlating with the pathophysiology what I have discussed now. So, now if you see the clinical presentation of these individuals, first the important thing is these individuals they are having polyuria and as well as the polydipsia. So, why do you think that these individuals will have polydipsia? The reason is, now the large quantity of the water is getting excreted out in the form of urine. So, thereby what will happen to the serum osmolality? The serum osmolality is increased. So, once the serum osmolality is increased, the osmoreceptors gets activated and the activated osmoreceptors will stimulate the thirst centers which are present within the hypothalamus and that will activate the thirst of the individual which will result in polydipsia. Next. The other thing is, now, here we have seen that th there is activation of RAS, right, and due to which there is formation of aldosterone. Now, because of the aldosterone being formed, that is excreting the potassium and that is excreting even the H plus ion as well. And that will result in what is called as hypokalemic, right, that will result in what is called as hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Right, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Okay, and this hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis is without hypertension. Right, is without hypertension. Now the question comes why there is no hypertension? Remember, why there is no hypertension is because, see, even though aldosterone is causing sodium and water retention, and at the same time there is a water loss due to impairment of the activity of the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel which is present at the loop of Henle. That is the reason why in these individuals there is no hypertension. Next, the other important point let me tell you here. Now, you take in case of these children with the Bartter syndrome, like you take the inner hair cells, right, within the ear, like we have external ear, middle ear and as well as the internal ear. Now, you take the internal ear, right, you take the internal ear. Within the internal ear, like we have what is called as Potassium secreting, right? Potassium secreting hair cells, 
which are being present. Now, in these individuals, what is happening to the potassium secretion? What we have discussed, potassium secretion is getting impaired. So, even this potassium secreting channels which are present within the inner hair cells are being distorted or disturbed. And not only that, even the chloride channels which are present within the inner hair cells, they also, there is impairment of their function. Now, because of the impairment of the potassium channels or the impairment of the chloride channels which are present within the inner hair cells, these individuals, they suffer from what is called as the sensory neural deafness. Right, they suffer from what is called sensory neural deafness. Right, and if you take this particular deafness, like we have two types of deafness. One is the conducting deafness and the other one is sensory neural deafness. Conducting deafness is mainly because of the obstruction within the external ear or middle ear. Whereas sensory neural deafness is mainly due to damage to the inner hair cells or due to damage to your vestibulocochlear nerve. Now, if you take the appearance of these individuals, right, you see the appearance of the child. Now, remember, if you see the appearance of the child, you see this image, this is how the child will appear. In this particular child, if you see the face of the child, it is triangular in appearance. So, this particular child will have, right, this particular child will have the triangular face, right, and apart from this particular triangular face, you see the mouth of the child, right, the mouth will be with drooping mouth, right, with drooping mouth, and you see the eyes of the individual, right, these eyes if you take, this child, they will have very large eyes. Not only large eyes, you see the pinna. Right? They will also have the presence of a large pinna. And apart from this, this particular child will have renal failure. So, this is what is the, right? This is what is the appearance of the child with barter syndrome right this is the appearance of the child with the barter syndrome now continuing with the clinical features right continuing with the clinical features now we have a type of barter syndrome which is called as the classic barter syndrome now in these patients with the right in these patients with the classic barter syndrome right this occurs during the childhood i'll tell you what will be the features these individuals, now what did we discuss regarding the potassium levels? The potassium levels are reduced, right? Why? Because one, due to the aldosterone being secreted because of RAS mechanism. Second, the sodium which is not being reabsorbed at the loop of NLA, it goes to the distal tubules and it gets secreted or it is being reabsorbed in exchange with the potassium due to which the potassium is being lost. And not only that, the potassium channels, there is impairment in the loop of NLA and that is another reason why there can be the potassium secreting into the lumen and getting excreted out. So, these individuals, they suffer from hypokalemia and because of hypokalemia, what all will be the features? The individual will have weakness and as well as cramps. So, this particular weakness and cramps, this occurs secondary to hypokalemia. Now, because of this hypokalemia, as already we have discussed, these individuals will also have the polyuria. Now, polyuria and as well as the nocturia. And also I have said that the impairment of these channels, that is sodium potassium 2 chloride channels and the chloride channels and as well as the ROMK channel which is present at the loop of NLA for the potassium, impairment of these channels will cause impairment of the creation of the gradient and thereby the calcium absorption does not occur. And that will result in what is called as nephrocalcinosis. So, if you see this nephrocalcinosis, this nephrocalcinosis is mainly due to hypercalciuria. Right? It is due to hypercalciuria. Okay? So, this is a very important, I mean, the important point regarding the barters. Now, now, you take this particular Bartos. Remember, if you see this Bartos syndrome, like we have the following types in the Bartos syndrome. Like the, there are totally five types of Bartos. So, next, next let me explain you 
the classification of Barter syndrome. If you take the classification, remember there are totally five types of Barter syndrome. Right? There are totally five types of the Barter syndrome. Now, out of these particular five types, remember the first four types they are autosomal recessive. Whereas, if you take the fifth type of the Barter syndrome, the mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant type of inheritance, right? Autosomal dominant mode of transmission. Now, let me talk up, let me take up some differences among all these particular five types of the Barter syndrome. So, if you see the Barters, so we have type 1, then we have type 2, then we have type 3, then we have type 4 and then we have type 5 Barter syndrome. Okay. Now, if you take the inheritance, that is the first thing like what you need to check. Inheritance, if you see, it is autosomal recessive type of inheritance up to almost type 4. Whereas in type 5, the inheritance is autosomal dominant type of inheritance. Okay, next. Now, after this, you take the site of the tubule which is being affected. Right, site of the tubule which is being affected. You take in case of type 1, it is a thick ascending limb which is being affected. Whereas in case of type 2, along with the thick ascending limb, even the collecting duct is also impaired or affected. Whereas type 3, the effect is in the thick ascending limb and as well as the distal convoluted tubule. And even in type 4, it is the same that is thick ascending limb and as well as the distal convoluted tubule. Whereas you take in case of type 5, it is a thick ascending limb which is being affected. Now, after the site, let me tell you the other important difference that is the gene which is being affected in the individual types. Now, you take in case of type 1. The gene which is being affected is SLC12A1, right? That is a gene which is being affected in case of type 1 batters. You take in case of type 2 batters, the gene which is being affected is, it is KCNJ1. Whereas in type 3 batters, remember, the gene which is being affected is, it is called as CLCBRK gene. And in type 4 batters, it is BS and D, right, B, S and D, whereas you take in case of type 5 batters, the gene which is being affected is the C, A, S, R, right, C, A, S, R. Next, after having discussed about the gene which is being affected, you need to know what is the protein which is being affected because once there is a gene mutation, the proteins which are being formed from the gene is also being affected. So, now if you take the protein, remember in case of the type 1 batters, the protein which is being affected is NKCC2, type 2 batters it is ROMK which is present in the loop of NLA and then in case of type 3 batters, the protein which is being affected is CICNKB, then you take in case of type 3 batters, it is the Bartin protein which is being affected, whereas in case of type 5 batters, it is the protein which is being affected is the CAR. So, these are the proteins which are being affected in the individual types of the batter syndrome. Next point. You see the onset. Right? You see the onset. If you take the onset, you take in case of type 1 batters, it is both either the onset might be prenatal or even the postnatal. Now, what is the basic problem in this individual? The water is not being reabsorbed adequately. So, thereby, what would be the prenatal presentation of these particular uh, individuals will be the mother, the, if you take the maternal history, there will be history of polyhydromnios. Why? Because the child is excreting the large quantity of water that is in the form of polyuria. So, that gets excreted in the amniotic fluid and that results in what is called as polyhydramnias. So, the onset will be prenatal and as well as the postnatal. 
and even this is also same that is prenatal and as well as the postnatal that is type 2 batters whereas type 3 batters the onset it is variable whereas in type 4 batters it is both prenatal and as well as the postnatal and type 5 batters the onset is variable okay so this is about the onset now after having discussed about the onset now I have said you that PGE2 levels that is urine prostaglandin E2 levels they will be increased because of this polyuria or nocturia. So if you take the urine PGE2. So this particular urine PGE2 in type 1 butters it is very high and even in type 2 butters it is same it is very high. In type 3 butters it is only slightly elevated. And whereas, even in case of type 4 and type 5, the urine prostaglandin E2 levels are elevated. Next, following that, like what did we discuss regarding the potassium? Regarding the potassium, we have seen that the individual will have hypokalemia. Not only that, if you take the ABG of these individuals, they will have what is called as metabolic alkalosis. Why? Because the H plus ion is being excreted out. So, if you take this component of hypokalemia and as well as the metabolic alkalosis. In type 1 batters, yes, hypokalemia metabolic alkalosis is present. Even in type 2, it is present. Type 3, also it is being present. Type 4, also being present. And even type 5, also being present. So, this is about your hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Next, following that, you see the features of these individuals. Right? One important, important feature is polyuria and because of polyuria, you will notice the signs of dehydration, right? You will notice the signs of dehydration, right? That is sunken anterior fontanel, right? Decreased skin targar, dry mouth, right? And dry mucous membrane, these will be the signs of dehydration. Now, not only that, the water, it constitutes nearly around 70 to 80 percent of the newborn. Now, if adequate water is not being present or if adequate electrolytes are not being present, this child, they suffer from the growth retardation, right? They suffer from growth retardation or failure or failure to thrive. Okay, next, you take in case of type 2 batters. In type 2 batters, the presentation is almost same. Whereas in type 3 batters, the presentation, it is slightly variable. And remember, type 3 batters, it is the mildest form among all the batter syndrome. Whereas you take type 4 batters. In type 4 batters, you have the features of type 1. And along with that, there is also sensory neural hearing loss. Right, sensory neural hearing loss. And lastly, you take type 5 batters. In type 5 batters, definitely there will be seizures, right? Along with the other features, there is also seizures. Now, the question comes why there is seizures. The question comes why there is seizures is because of hypocalcemia. Now, I have said you that the proper working of the channels is very much important across the loop of NLA and maintenance of the gradient and if the gradient is not being maintained the calcium is not being reabsorbed and the individual will suffer from what is called as hypocalcemia and because of hypocalcemia they'll have the seizures now the multiple there are two multiple choice questions that you need to remember here right which is the least common type of batters right you take type 5 this is the least common one Right, this is the least common one. And which is the mildest form? That is your type 3 batters, which is the mildest form. Now, the other important difference what you need to remember is about the nephrocalcinosis. Right, nephrocalcinosis. If you take nephrocalcinosis, except for type 4 batters, right, except for type 4 batters, you will see nephrocalcinosis in all the types of batter syndrome. Right. In fact, you take in case of the type 5 batters, the nephrocalcinosis or hypercalciuria is rather more compared to the others. That is the reason because of hypocalcemia, these individuals, they may have even 
the presence of the seizures. So, after having discussed about the clinical features and as well as the various types of Bartter syndrome, now let me tell you how do you diagnose this particular Bartter syndrome. So, coming to the diagnosis of the Bartter syndrome, right? Let me take up one by one. You take the potassium. What will happen to the potassium in these individuals? There will be hypokalemia, right? Why? Because of impairment of the potassium channels at the loop of NLA. Because of excessive aldosterone production, there will be hypokalemia. In fact, there is very severe hypokalemia. Now, you take the ABG of the individual. What does it show? It shows metabolic alkalosis. Right? Why do you think that there is metabolic alkalosis? Because the H plus ion is being excreted by your excessive aldosterone being produced. Now, how much will be the blood pressure of these individuals? Remember, the blood pressure is completely normal. Right? Even though excessive aldosterone production is there, which will cause sodium and water retention. But there is also the water loss which is there in excess quantity because of the impairment of sodium chloride to potassium channels which is present at the loop, at the loop of Henle. Next, you take the urinary potassium. See, you take the urinary potassium, you take the urinary calcium, you take the urinary sodium. Everything is elevated. Right? Everything is being elevated. Not only that, you take the serum renin, serum renin, aldosterone and as well as the prostaglandin E is also elevated. The other important investigations is that this particular child will suffer from what is called as the chloride resistant Right, chloride resistant metabolic alkalosis. Right, chloride resistant metabolic alkalosis. And you take the magnesium levels. Remember, these individuals they will have normal magnesium. Right, and what will happen to the urinary calcium? We have discussed the urinary calcium is very much increased. So, why do you think that the urinary calcium is increased? That is because the absorption of the calcium does not occur because of the impairment of the channel working and impairment of the gradient which is being created. Now, finally, let me discuss the treatment of the Bartter syndrome. Now, remember, you see here, the features of these patients with the Bartter syndrome, they get precipitated or mainly because of increase in the prostaglandin E2 levels, that is PGE2. Now, you need to give a drug which will inhibit this particular prostaglandin production and what are those particular drugs? that is nothing but indomethacin. Indomethacin, remember, it is a COX-1 inhibitor. Right, it is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. So, thereby, once you inhibit the COX, there is no prostaglandin production. Now, the multiple choice question that will be asked is, this indomethacin, it is not only being used in case of Bartter syndrome, there are multiple places where you can use Bartus, sorry, indomethacin, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Number one, it can be used in patients with the patent ductus arteriosus. All right. And next, it is used in the treatment of acute migraine. Next, it is also used in the treatment of mild gout. Right. For mild to moderate gout, in order to have the pain relief, we give this indomethacin. All right. Now, along with indomethacin, because there is a sodium loss in these individuals, so you need to give the salt supplements. Right. You need to give the salt supplements and as well as the potassium supplements. Right. And as well as the potassium supplements. So, this will be about the Bartter syndrome. Just basic principle what you should remember is that there is defect in the sodium potassium 2 chloride channels at the level of the loop of NLA. And because of that, the entire cycle of events will occur in these patients with the Bartter syndrome. And very important thing finally, the Bartter syndrome, the features resembles the loop diuretics. Now, let me show you some of the questions on the Bartter syndrome. Now, you see this question on the Bartter syndrome. Yes. In Bartter syndrome, what is seen? Metabolic alkalosis 
hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, and decrease in the urinary calcium. So, what do you think you will see? Number one, potassium is not being reabsorbed. The potassium is secreted out by your aldosterone and as well as even within the channels which are present at the loop of Henle. So, that is the reason why these individuals, they will have hypokalemia. That is one answer. And the other thing is there is also excessive aldosterone production. And because of excessive aldosterone production, the H plus ion gets excreted out and that will result in metabolic alkalosis. So, that is the reason why, remember these individuals, they will have metabolic alkalosis and as well as hypokalemia. They will not have hyperkalemia. And the other point is that it will, there will not be decrease in the urinary calcium. There is increase in the urinary calcium in these individuals with the Barter syndrome. Next. Now, the other important syndrome that we need to discuss is the Gittleman syndrome. Right. So, we will discuss Gittleman syndrome and we will compare that with the Barter syndrome. And then we will come back to this question. You just see this question here. All of the following statements about Barter syndrome and Gittleman syndrome are true except autosomal recessive inheritance, Barter syndrome presents earlier in life than the Gittleman syndrome, genetic defect Barter syndrome involves the transport protein in the distal tubules, hypercalciuria is more common in case of Barter syndrome rather than the Gittleman syndrome. So, the question is asking us which is the incorrect statement right the question which is asked is except so we will discuss the gentleman's and then we will compare both gentleman's and batters and then we will come back to this particular question now you see here so if you see the gentleman syndrome gentleman syndrome remember the features of gentleman syndrome it is similar to that of the thyroid diuretics. Right, it mimics thyroid diuretics. Now, what are your thyroid diuretics? Like mainly the hydrochlorothiazide and as well as your chlorthalidone all right now let me show you where this particular thyroid diuretics will act and what is the mechanism of action of this thyroid diuretics so basically these also are the drugs which will cause diuresis but these are remember these are medium efficacy diuretics compared to that of the loop diuretics which are the high efficacy diuretics now going back to our image of the nephron now if you take this particular nephron like we have what is called as the distal convoluted tubule right you have the dct and within the dct like you have what is called the sodium chloride transporter right sodium chloride transporter what the thyroid diuretics will do is thyroid diuretics will inhibit the sodium chloride channel that is the sodium chloride co-transporter is being inhibited by your thyroid diuretics now once the sodium chloride co-transporter is inhibited by your thyroid diuretics remember there is no absorption of the sodium and as well as the chloride this will happen in thyroid diuretics and the same thing even you take in case of Gittleman syndrome. In Gittleman syndrome, the problem is with the same channel which is present in the distal convoluted tubule. So, even in Gittleman's, there is impairment of the sodium chloride co-transporter and thereby there is excessive excretion of the sodium in the urine. Right? There is excessive excretion of the sodium in the urine and even there is excessive excretion of the chloride within the urine. Is that clear? Now, now Based on this particular principle, we will discuss the points about the Gittleman syndrome. Now, you take this Gittleman syndrome, a point that you should understand is, this is also autosomal recessive type of inheritance. And where is the genetic defect which is being present? The genetic defect which is being present, it is present in the distal convoluted tubule. And what is the age group at which you see this particular Gittleman syndrome? Remember, this Gittleman syndrome, it is seen in the late childhood. Right, it is present in the late childhood and as well as the early adulthood. Whereas, you take the comparison in case of Barter syndrome. In Barter syndrome, the age of presentation is early in the life of the individual. 
right whereas here this is late childhood and as well as the early adulthood now so if you take the pathophysiology the pathophysiology in these individuals is right i'll show you one of the magnified image of the tubule of the distal convoluted tubule so in the distal convoluted tubule you see this this is your sodium chloride co-transporter and then we have one more channel which is present in the distal convoluted tubule which is required for the reabsorption of magnesium and that particular channel is your trp m6 this particular trp m6 this is required for the reabsorption of right for the reabsorption of magnesium now in these individuals with the gentleman syndrome there is defect in the sodium chloride channel and there is also defect within the trp m6 channel which is required for the magnesium reabsorption now consequent to this what will happen the sodium and chloride will not be reabsorbed and even the magnesium is also not being reabsorbed in these individuals with the gentleman syndrome so in case of gentleman syndrome remember there is impairment of sodium chloride co transporter right along with that right there is impairment of the sodium chloride co transporter along with that there is also defect in the trp m6 channel which is required for the reabsorption of magnesium so in these individuals there is impairment of the sodium chloride co transporter at the level of the distal convoluted tubule and there is also impairment of the trp m6 channel and this particular trp m6 channel it is required for the reabsorption of the magnesium so once this particular trp m6 channel is being impaired there is no reabsorption of the magnesium and the magnesium starts getting excreted out within the urine so a point that you should understand is the urinary magnesium levels are high in these individuals with the gentleman syndrome see in case of the bartter syndrome the urinary calcium was high because the calcium was not getting reabsorbed because of the impairment of the concentration gradient which is not being created whereas here the magnesium is not being reabsorbed because of the impairment of the trp6 trp m6 channel okay now now let me discuss the clinical features now because the sodium and chloride is not being reabsorbed what will happen what will happen here is you see now the so through this particular sodium and chloride channel even the water is also being reabsorbed now once the sodium and chloride channel is being inhibited the water is not being reabsorbed so now once the water is not being reabsorbed what these individuals they will have is these individuals they will have polyuria right they will have polyuria okay now so why is this particular polyuria this is mainly due to salt wasting right this is mainly because of the salt wasting okay this is one point next now the other important thing is along with the polyuria they will also have even nocturia so this polyuria and as well as nocturia remember it is present in almost 50 to 80 percentage of individuals right present in almost 50 to 80 percentage of individuals next now the other important point is you take the antenatal history now this particular child right or this particular individual will start urinating large quantity of water even within the fetal life as well so that is why you take the antenatal history right there will be right there will be antenatal history of polyhydramnios right there will be antenatal history of polyhydramnios because the fetus is passing large amount of urine right because the fetus is passing large amount of urine now the other important thing is now the water i have said you it constitutes nearly 70 to 80 percentage of the newborn or uh, the individual so that is the reason why these individuals they will also have failure to thrive
right these individuals they will also have failure to thrive why because of loss of water and as well as electrolytes right because of loss of water and as well as the electrolytes and because of the loss of water and electrolytes these individuals they will have the features of dehydration all right so what will be the features of the dehydration these particular features of the dehydration they include sunken anterior fontanel right sunken anterior fontanel and as well as the presence of delayed skin pinch right that is nothing but reduced skin turgor now within the baby what is another feature is because there is polyuria so there will be another history which is like a frequent right frequent diaper or the nappy change okay now now the other thing is now because of the fluid loss what will happen to the volume the fluid volume the fluid volume is reduced and because of this there is again activation of ras and because of this there is increase in the renin levels as well and because of the increase in the renin levels there is increase in aldosterone secretion right there is increase in aldosterone secretion and because of increase in aldosterone secretion there is excess loss of potassium and as well as the h plus ion now because of excess loss of potassium right because of excess loss of potassium these individuals they are having hypokalemia because of hypokalemia the child will have a very poor cry because the potassium is very much required for the muscle metabolism if the potassium is not there the individual will land up in what is called as the muscle weakness or myopathy so due to which they will have very poor cry and is as well as the sluggish morose reflex right sluggish morose reflex now not only that the h plus ion is being getting excreted out and that will result in metabolic alkalosis right metabolic alkalosis now now you see the other important point that is regarding the magnesium so magnesium is being not absorbed why because of the impairment of the channel that is trp m6 channel so thereby these individuals will suffer from hypomagnesemia right these individuals they will suffer from hypomagnesemia a very important point related to physiology you need to remember here that is magnesium is very much required for the release of parathormone from the chief cells of the parathyroid gland right magnesium is very much required for the release of the parathormone from the chief cells of the parathyroid gland now if magnesium is not there right if magnesium is not there then the parathormone levels are reduced right once the parathormone levels are reduced these individuals they suffer from hypocalcemia right and because of hypocalcemia remember they will suffer, they will have what is called as tetany right they will have tetany right and not only that they will have all <coughs> other features of hypocalcemia that is they can have perioral paresthesias right they can have tingling and as well as numbness within the extremities and not only that they will also have periungual paresthesias right periungual paresthesias 
no because parathormone is not there right because parathormone is not there the calcium levels within the serum will be reduced so this is a very important point that you need to remember now what is happening to the urinary magnesium here remember the urinary magnesium is increased right urinary magnesium is increased okay next the other point is right the other point is you take the prostaglandin e2 levels what would we discuss in case of barter syndrome the prostaglandin e2 levels are increased whereas here the prostaglandin e2 levels they are normal right the prostaglandin e2 levels are normal now you take the investigations in these patients with the gittleman syndrome you take the serum sodium and as well as the potassium what will happen they are decreased so why do you think the sodium is decreased because sodium chloride co-transporter is impaired why do you think the potassium is decreased because there is excessive activation of ras right aldosterone will cause potassium excretion see you may think here that the aldosterone will cause sodium retention but the point what you should remember is the amount of the sodium which is being lost because of the sodium chloride co-transporter impairment is more compared to that of the sodium which is being reabsorbed by your the aldosterone so that is the reason why there will be hyponatremia in these individuals now along with the sodium the water is also being lost so that is why you see the urine osmolality the urine osmolality is decreased in these individuals now what will be the investigation of choice in these individuals is now along with the sodium the chloride is also being lost or excreted in these individuals the 24 hour urine chloride levels are increased so this is the investigation of choice and not only that you take the serum magnesium the serum magnesium levels they are also reduced in these individuals with the gittleman syndrome now after this let me tell you a very important point that is the differences between the barter syndrome and as well as the gittleman syndrome okay so on one side you take the picture of the barter syndrome the other side you take the picture of the gittleman syndrome okay right first this barter syndrome it mimics loop diuretics whereas gittleman syndrome it mimics thiazide diuretics right it mimics the thiazide diuretics next you take inheritance in both of them it is autosomal recessive type of inheritance there is no difference in this only difference you take type 5 barter syndrome where you have autosomal dominant type of inheritance whereas the remaining four types of barter syndrome it is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and you take the pathophysiology where is the site of pathophysiology here in case of barter syndrome it is in the ascending limb of loop of Henle, whereas here it is in the distal convoluted tubule right next now you take the other differences now what is the channel which is being defective in case of batters that is in that is sodium potassium two chloride channels right not only that even the potassium channel or the chloride channel is also being defective whereas in case of gittleman's it is your sodium chloride co-transporter and along with that the magnesium channel which is encoded by trp m6 is also being defective next you take the age of presentation the age of presentation in case of batters it is early in the life whereas in gittleman syndrome it is in late adulthood sorry late childhood or early adulthood right early adulthood okay next now the clinical presentation if you see the clinical features in both of them there is no hypertension right in both of them there is no hypertension right and the, in both of them the other common feature is the presence of polyuria so here also there is polyuria here also there is polyuria the differentiating point is you take the nephrocalcinosis nephrocalcinosis
is present in case of Bartos, absent in case of the Gittleman syndrome. All right. Next, the other important thing you take in these patients with the Gittleman's, they will have the features of hypocalcemia that is in the form of tetany. And not only that, there can be even the presence of perioral and as well as the periangual paresthesias. And these individuals, they will also have, right, they will also have neuromuscular manifestations, but they are mild, right. And these patients with the Gittleman syndrome, apart from the features of the renal failure, I mean, apart from the features of the electrolyte disturbances, they will also have sensory neural hearing loss, right. Why? because of the impairment of the chloride channels or the potassium channels which are present within the inner hair cells. Next. Now, these individuals, if you take the face of the individual with the Bartos syndrome, it is a triangular face. And if you take the eyes of the individual, it is a very large eyes and as well as the ear pinna is also very large. Right. And they will also have drooping mouth. Next. You take the laboratory investigations. Now, in case of Gittel Bartos, it is chloride resistance. Right, chloride resistant metabolic alkalosis. The same thing you observe even in case of the Gittleman syndrome as well. And both of them they suffer from hypokalemia. Right? But the magnesium is different. You take in case of the Bartos syndrome, they will have normal magnesium, whereas Gittleman syndrome, they will have hypomagnesemia. Next, you take the urinary calcium. Now, you take the urinary calcium in case of Bartos syndrome, there is increased urinary calcium. Whereas here in case of Gittleman's, there is decreased or in fact normal urinary calcium. Right, normal urinary calcium. Now, because of increase in the urinary calcium, these individuals, they are more prone for nephrocalcinosis. Whereas here, there is no nephrocalcinosis. Okay. Next, you take the PGE2 levels. The PGE2 levels, they are increased in case of Bartos. They remain normal in case of Gittleman syndrome. So, these are the differences between the Bartos syndrome and as well as the Gittleman syndrome. So, if you take this question now, all of the following statements about the Bartos syndrome and Gittleman syndrome are true except autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance right that is a correct answer in both of them it is autosomal recessive type of inheritance next you take the Bartos syndrome Bartos syndrome presents earlier in life than Gittleman syndrome that is what we have discussed Bartos syndrome it is present early in the life whereas in case of Gittleman syndrome it is seen in case of late childhood or early adulthood now you take the third option genetic defect Bartos syndrome involves the transport protein in the distal tubules that is an incorrect option there because in Bartos syndrome, like what did we discuss, the electrolyte channel which is being impaired or ineffective is at the level of ascending limb of loop of NLA, but not at the level of distal convoluted tubule. Now, hypercalciuria is more common in Bartos syndrome, right? That is the fourth option. So, what did we discuss just now? Like we have seen that the urinary calcium is increased in these patients with the Bartos syndrome, but not with the Gittleman syndrome. And that is the reason why nephrocalcinosis is more common in case of Bartos syndrome, okay? So now in this question, if you see, the answer is C, right? In this question, if you see, the answer is C. So that completes, right? That completes the discussion of the Bartos syndrome and as well as the Gittleman syndrome. Now, we have one more hereditary nephritis that is what is called as the Liddell syndrome. Now, if you take the Liddell syndrome, let me show you a question how it can be framed on the Liddells. Okay. So before going into the Liddells, we have one more question on the Bartos. All of the following are the features of the Bartos syndrome except hypokalemia. Yes, hypokalemia will be there. You take the hypermagnesemia. Remember, they will not have hypermagnesemia, right? They will not have hypermagnesemia. Magnesium levels are normal in these patients with the Bartos syndrome. And in fact, you take in case of Gittleman syndrome, they will have hypomagnesemia and hyperprostaglandinemia. Yes, prostaglandin PGE2 levels are increased in these patients with the Bartos syndrome. That is the reason why we are giving indomethacin, which is a prostaglandin inhibitor or which, in, which inhibit the cox and that by the prostaglandin levels will not get increased, okay. And hypercalciuria, yes, there will be hypercalciuria in these patients with the Bartos syndrome. That is the reason why there is nephrocalcinosis. So, what is the answer here? Which is that you don't see here? Hypermagnesemia, you don't see in these patients with the Bartos syndrome. Is that clear? Right. Yes. 
Now we will come to the question, I mean, discussion on the Liddell syndrome. Now the question that can be framed on the Liddell syndrome is in this in this way. This was the uh, recently asked neat question. Hypertension with hypokalemia is seen in Barter syndrome, Liddell Liddell syndrome, Gittleman syndrome, all of the above. What did we just discuss in case of Barter syndrome and as well as Gittleman syndrome? The blood pressure is normal. They will not have hypertension. Whereas in case of Liddell syndrome, they will have hypertension. So now let me take up the discussion on the Liddell syndrome. 